Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I am here today to do my Friday Reads video where I wrap up the week in reading and talk about any other exciting bookish things that have happened and sometimes sad bookish things that have happened. I did manage to finish two books this week. We'll get to that when we do the actual Friday Reads portion of this video. I have, I think, just two things that I want to cover before we get there. And the first is sad. It is that Milan Kundera unfortunately passed away this week and I just wanted to acknowledge that because he is a giant of literature. He is someone who has frequently been floated as a possibility for the Nobel Prize for Literature. It did not happen, and unfortunately the Nobel Prize does not go, uh, is not awarded posthumously. So the possibility is now gone. He is a very interesting author. I have only read one of his books at this point, and that was The Book of Laughter and Forgetting. I read that in a college course, and I was very glad that I read it in a college course, because I'm not sure being honest, that I would have fully understood that book. I think the discussions about it really helped me understand what was going on in that book and the context around that book and why it was written. And honestly, I even now, I think I admire what went into the book, the purpose of writing the book and what it was trying to do more than I admired the book itself. But I have always wanted to read another one of his books. I've just been intimidated to do so, if I'm honest, because now that I'm outside of the classroom atmosphere, I've been sort of intimidated because I think it was that discussion that really helped me understand what was going on and the fact that it was also a very personal book for the professor of the class in which we read it. I don't have a copy of that book anymore. I was living in New York at the time and uh, shelf space was extremely limited, as you can imagine. So I believe I swapped it for a copy of The Unbearable Lightness of Being, which is probably Milan Kundera's most famous book. It was adapted into a movie and probably the most recognizable title of his. And I have not read it, so at some point I will get around to it. I don't think it will be this year, but it sort of renewed my enthusiasm to try another one of his works. I think the benefit of Unbearable Lightness of Being is that there's a lot about this book online, so even if I'm outside of a classroom atmosphere, I do feel like there will be a lot of support for me in my reading of this book when I eventually get to it. But uh, I just wanted to mention that because a giant of literature, not as well known as some others, like say Salman Rushdie or anything like that, but uh, definitely worth noting and worth mentioning. Actually, one more thing to mention, I am wearing another shirt that I got from Lake Maureen when we we were there to celebrate our 10th anniversary. I'm just a big fan of this shirt. I thought it was adorable. And once we actually managed to canoe on Maureen Lake, I had to have this t-shirt because it just, it tickles me. And if you want more details about our anniversary trip, they were in my last Friday Reads video. So that will be linked down below, along with the other videos that I filmed this week, uh, including we did our video of the best 2023 reads so far, we being me and my husband, Joel. Uh, you got three Joel videos in a row because he joined me for my Friday reads and then he was here for the best books of 2023 so far. And then we did our June reading wrap up. All those will be down below, but hopefully you got a good fix of Joel uh, and we'll have him again soon because we're halfway through July already. So in no time at all, we'll be wrapping up this reading month and talking about that. So he'll definitely be back for that, if not anything else. The other thing I wanted to mention before we get into the Friday Read section is that Joel and I started watching a documentary series on Max, which used to be HBO Max, and now it's just Max, adapted from this book, Last Call, A True Story of Love, Lust, and Murder in Queer New York by Elon Green. I did read this book the year in which it was published, and I liked it. I, I don't know that I loved it, but... It is really interesting. It mostly focuses on the victims of the serial killer who were uh, closeted gay men and I think at least one out gay man. There were, there were varying degrees of closetedness going on because these murders happened in the 1980s uh, in New York and they were not really adequately investigated by police because of the victims, because they were sort of gay crimes. And... I think the documentary series really goes in a lot harder on that aspect and has made it really interesting. There is only one episode that has been available. I'm hoping that this weekend there will be a second one and we can go get a little further. It's a really interesting story because it portrays gay life at the time and what it was like to be gay and to be forced into the closet a lot of the time and uh, to be sort of marginalized and live 
in the shadows of the rest of the world, where you really couldn't get attention, you couldn't get justice. This book sort of attempts to do the same thing that Hallie Rubin Holds the Five does, which is probably one of my favorite true crime books, because it really centers on the lives of the victims and pushes Jack the Ripper out of that book entirely. This book does end up focusing on the killer toward the end, just to sort of explain who he was, how he ended up doing the things that he did, and all of that. But it does mostly focus on the victims and their lives. And this, that, that kind of is where the interesting story of this is. And I'm really glad that the documentary series has picked that up and sort of, it's taken all of that and really expanded it a lot. And that has made it really interesting to watch. So we look forward to reading more of that. And I think that's everything before we get to the actual Friday Reads portion of the video. So let's dive in. I finished two books this week and they were big books. And the first one I finished was The Bandit Queens by Perini Shroff. This is something that had really caught my attention uh, when it was released and then uh, even jumped under my attention even more when it was longlisted for the Women's Prize. I'll have my video about the longlist down below. And I had kind of wanted to read it and just had not had time to do it, and but I always wanted to circle back. So I finally managed to do that. And considering that this is a book about really like heavy abuse of women, systemic inequalities and, thing, and murder, <laughs> it is surprisingly light and funny and enjoyable. And that is a pretty tough act to pull off, but Perini Shroff does a really good job. The premise of the book is that you have Gita, who is living in a small village in India. She has been in an abusive marriage, and her husband disappears one day. The town assumes that Gita murdered her husband because of the abuse. They knew that he was an abusive husband and just kind of a general awful person. But uh, So they assume that she murdered him, and that is why he has disappeared and has not come back. But that is not actually the case. So Gita is very isolated from the rest of the society because she is sort of assumed to be a murderer. And she ultimately takes solace in this. Like, she doesn't care that people think this about her. She almost revels in the fact that people take assume this about her because the end result is they leave her alone. And she's able to pursue things that she wants and live on her own terms. And this book is really about that. It's about women trying to live on their own terms in a male-dominated society. So this is sort of her way. This reputation as a murderess is what gets her to that. Things start getting complicated because another woman in the village comes to her wanting help getting rid of her own abusive husband. And chaos ensues from there. In order to make Gita a more sympathetic character... The novel does make her a little bit clumsy. She's a terrible liar. And she's really uncomfortable with a lot of the things that happen. And, or the idea of being a murderer. At least initially. And that part... There are some weak aspects of it. And I wish Gita was not as clumsy. I wish she wasn't as comically uh, incapable of lying. But... Almost like that character in Knives Out who throws up. It's not to that extreme, but it, it, it is sort of like that, or reminiscent of that at least. However, um, the relationships that develop between these women are really profound. There's an adorable dog, and it does make a lot of really interesting points about equality and um, agency. And again, just being able to live a life on your own terms and without judgment from other people without censure from a male-dominated society and it, it's a little bit about even just the ability to choose whether or not you become a mother outside of expectations from other people and I really appreciated all of those things that it does and again it's a funny book I actually laughed out loud several times which does not happen a lot for me from a book so that really says a lot I enjoyed this a great deal and I know there are people who have had mixed responses to it. I think this is an enjoyable book, but I think as soon as it ends up on something like the Women's Prize Longlist, people have sort of loftier expectations for what is going to happen in it. And ultimately, there are a lot of points about, say, feminism, and it does make a lot of points about caste in India as well. So there's a lot of sort of meaty thematic material in the book, 
but it's in the form of a sort of crime caper. And I think if you think if you think of the Women's Prize long list as something for serious literature, then there's going to be a bit of cognitive dissonance when you read this book. And you know there are those meaty thematic messages stuck in there. But ultimately, it's a very funny book. It's sort of breezy and uh, feels very lighthearted in a way, which again is a mean feat for a book that is really about abuse and murder. Um, if those are triggers for you, I would say you should be a little bit careful. But I would also say that this book is so breezy that I, I don't think they would be too much of an issue. But if it is a trigger for you, you should definitely be aware and take that into consideration before deciding to read it. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a lot of fun. And that is not something I really expected to say about a novel that's really, again, heavily about murder and mayhem. And I didn't realize how much it was also going to be about abuse. But it is. And I didn't realize that the, it, it, it is sort of inspired, or at least the title is inspired, by an actual woman in India who was nicknamed the Bandit Queen. Uh, she was a low-caste woman who uh, was abused and raped and ultimately became a bandit, an outlaw, um, to get revenge on the people who had wronged her. And she became a sort of folk hero after that. And I was completely unaware of that story, but it is true. You can Google the Bandit Queen and find out about her. And she is sort of a running theme in the book. Uh, Gita is very aware of the story of the Bandit Queen, and she considers the story at many points of the book. And I think it's it's a very interesting story. And it, although it's a little bit different from the circumstances of the real life Bandit Queen, um, it's interesting. I thought your mileage may vary, but I enjoyed it, and I thought it was a, a good deal of fun. The next book that I finished this past week was Let Us Descend by Jessman Ward. This book is not actually going to be released until October 24th, but I managed to get early access to an e-galley through NetGalley, and I read it this week. Now, I think I'm going to hold most of my thoughts on Let Us Descend so I can do a proper review next week and do a separate video about that. I don't think I will involve spoilers in that video. I know a lot of people are really concerned about spoilers. So let me preface the discussion of Let Us Descend by saying that there will not be spoilers for the book here, and I'm going to try to avoid spoilers in the video that will be coming next week as well, because I know people are always really concerned. There are people who don't even like to read the blurb of a book. I, I, that's something that I've experienced. And it's always interesting when they comment on a video to say, I'm not going to watch this video because I don't even want to know what this book is about. It's like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> it's okay. So I'm not going to discuss anything beyond what is in the marketing content for the book in this. And I'll try to do the same in the video that will come next week. I think this is a book that is going to need to sit for a little bit before I really properly discuss it anyway. It is a difficult book. It's certainly actually much more difficult than The Bandit Queens, and you know that from the subject matter. It is very much about the experience of enslavement, and that is a bit of a departure for Jessamyn Ward. Jessamyn Ward has been uh, a two-time National Book Award winner at this point for her last two novels, one of which Joel actually just got for me. Let me see if I can grab it real quick. So, spoiler for my book haul, he found a copy of Salvage the Bones for me, which I, I used to have a copy. And somehow when I moved from New York to Montana with Joel, um, it disappeared. I think what happened is I had some friends helping me pack as we were getting ready to move. And books... Anyone who has a lot of books will t can tell you that books are really heavy. They're difficult to move. And I didn't have that many books in my New York apartment because there just really wasn't space. But um, I have a friend who's a very literary person. And I think what happened, if I remember correctly, is as a thank you for helping, I gave him my copy of Salvage the Bones. And uh, I have not had a copy since. So I kind of wanted another one. And Joel found a used copy while he was traveling. All of it, this is not anything to do with <laughs> Let Us Descend, although I think there are actually interesting parallels between Let Us Descend and Salvage the Bones because Let Us Descend has big themes about uh, motherhood and protection, which definitely come up in Salvage the Bones. Jessamyn Ward's work has been 
very contemporary. This historical fiction is a big departure for her. I think she should have won a Pulitzer Prize for Sing Unburied Sing, which was her second National Book Award winning novel. And unfortunately, that did not happen. She lost to less. It's a whole thing for me. I did a video about it, and uh, I'll link it down below. It's, it's mostly about less and the type of book that is typically seen as worthy of a Pulitzer Prize, but I definitely discuss Sing Unburied Sing in that. So check it out if you want the full situation. It's interesting because a black woman has not won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction since Toni Morrison did it for Beloved in 1988. And I feel like Jessamyn Ward has been consistently making a case for herself. I don't know. It'll be interesting because there are a lot of heavy hitters coming in the second part of 2023. So I feel like it's a little too early. I've allowed myself to get like pumped about like, this is the book that will probably get her across the finish line. But I, I'm trying to be a lot more measured in that. And I don't want to create a whole lot of hype for people because I think hype can be a really dangerous thing. When you set expectations really high and then you read something, it, it, it can be very difficult. And I think a, a lot of that happened with Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver, and I contributed to that because I loved that book, and I was really enthusiastic about it. And I don't want to, you know, set expectations to an unrealistic level for people. Um, I liked Let Us Descend. I am definitely going to be thinking about it a lot. It is a painful book in the same way that Toni Morrison's Beloved is painful, although it doesn't have the prickly... There's a lot of stuff going on and like symbolism in Beloved that also makes it very difficult to read. Um, not just the content and the content in Let Us Descend is very difficult. What's interesting about it is that it is a very sensory experience. Jess Jessman Ward does a really good job making you feel the things that the protagonist whose name is Annis touches. She makes you smell what she smells and taste what she tastes and that is really interesting. And I think that's sort of the new thing that she brings to the table when it comes to this type of story. And it is sort of inspired in a way, I don't want to oversell this because it's it's not really, but it does take some inspiration from Dante's Inferno in that it sort of takes you on a tour of hell, essentially. The hell being enslavement in the United States. And... Um, Annis is born on a plantation in North Carolina, and she ultimately is sold and goes on a journey where she is taken to New Orleans to be sold again to a sugar plantation. That is in the marketing copy, and that is um, the, the, the basic premise of the book. So much more happens in there. I don't really want to say a lot more about the plot. I'll save some of it for the review video that will be coming next week. But it is very interesting, and I think the main thing that Jessamyn Ward does that is so powerful is she really puts you in the head of oh, someone who is going through all of this. And that is a very powerful and difficult experience. I think this book would be well worth your time. I will have a link down below to pre-order it. The link is to bookshop.org. If you have a local independent store that you like, I would encourage you to reach out to them, but uh, bookshop.org is a good option other than the big behemoth that I don't like because it supports independent bookstores, and I would recommend that. You could, I'm sure your library will be getting a copy of Let Us Descend as well. I'd be shocked if they don't, but it is always possible. I think it will be well worth your time, and I'm going to be thinking about the book a little more over the weekend and preparing a, a review video that I'm hopefully going to be filming probably late next week. So you can stay tuned for that. But for anyone who's really concerned about spoilers and not knowing about, you know, doesn't want to know a whole lot about the book, I'll probably leave it at that for now. And I will also plug, Salvage the Bones is a great book. Sing Unburied Sing is also a great book. Uh, so if you are unfamiliar with the work of Jessamyn Ward, I would say she is definitely worth your time and worth getting to know as a writer. So what's next? Well, the E.M. Forster read-along book for this month is Howard's End. I have a copy right here. So I had been thinking, because I read this physical copy of it the first time I read this book, which is a little more than 10 years ago. I think I read this in 2010, maybe 2009, somewhere around there. And 
I read the physical copy, so I'm thinking I might want to do an audio if I can find a good audio of it. And then maybe I'll just follow along because I took a lot of notes in this book when I read it the first time. And that, that says a lot because I was not someone who liked marking up books. If I did, it really meant I was into what it was saying. So that tells you a lot. So I'm probably, I was thinking that I would listen to the audio and sort of follow along with my notes, just, you know, skim through and take note, note down in my mind, anything that I had marked up, uh, the first time through. Here's the complication. I forgot to grab my copy of I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. It's over there and, uh, I'm not going to go grab it, but I have had a hold on the audio of that book for months. I think I put a hold on it in February and it just became available. So I think I'm going to listen to that and then I'll decide what to do with Howard's End. I am still thinking that I'd like to try an audio because I think I've wanted to do an audio of A Room with a View since I had read that one in print the first time around. And I ultimately read the book. And that was an interesting experience because I had taken notes when I first read that, which was somewhere around 2007, I think. And it almost felt like I was sort of in conversation with me from whenever, whatever year it was that I did read that. So I think it was around 2007. And that was an interesting experience. So part of me would like to try to do that again because I took notes in Howard's End. But I think E.M. Forster... And his writing is beautiful enough that an, an audio would be a really great experience. So I'm thinking I might do it for this one. So once I'm done with I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings and whatever my next print book is going to be, I'll make a decision about how I'm going to read Howard's End. And if you're interested, I'll have information about the E.M. Forster read-along down below. I also really need to catch up with the Queer TBR Tackle. Uh, July is a sort of month off for the Queer TBR Tackle, and there will be information about that down below as well. But I didn't finish Stone Butch Blues in June because there was really heavy content in this and it was stressing me out and I had to put it down. I do really want to get back to it and finish this book. So I am thinking maybe at the end of July I'll try to fit that in if I get in some other things that I really want to do. Now, I want to do this other Eden by Paul Harding, but I'm thinking at this point that my next physical book is going to come down to one of these two. So I have When We Were Sisters by Fatima Asghar from the library. I have had this from the library since the beginning of June, maybe even the end of May. I've been able to renew it uh, until July 20th. So I have one week left and I'm at my renewal limit. I can't renew it again. There are no holds on it, so uh, I could probably return it and just get it back. But I'm thinking I might try to read this over the next week, just so I can do it. This was the winner of the inaugural Carol Shields Prize for Fiction. And it was on my pile of possibilities for Pride Month because it does have queer elements in it. I believe it was long listed for the National Book Award or something like that as well. Um, I'd be very curious to read it. So rather than just let it go, I'm thinking I might try to fit this in next and make a lot of progress over the weekend, and then I can just return it next week. So I might do that. But I also just got um, an advanced reader's copy of Good Women, Stories by, Stories by Hallie Hill. I mentioned this in my last Friday Reads video as well. This comes from Hub City Press, and it will be published on September 12th. I really want to read this. Uh, it had a blurb from Disha Filia, who wrote my beloved The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. So this is a definite contender, and it's only small. So part of me is even thinking I should just spend the weekend reading this, and then I can get to When We Were Sisters. But I feel like just for the library book of it all, I should probably do When We Were Sisters first, but I really want to read this. I'm really excited about it. And it's short, and it's stories, so I don't know. I don't know. But uh, this feels like a good contender to be next as well. Anyway, I think that's it for Friday Reads. As always, I really appreciate your time, and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.